have your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 5 for a few minutes. I'm surprised you don't need some oxygen after that, amen, praise God. I can uh, kid him because I'm a whole lot older than him, a whole lot. In fact, I asked somebody how old Brother Dan Reed was, he was one year younger than me. So, you know, every year and every breath, every day is a blessing from God. Y'all not waste it, y'all not waste it, y'all to use it to the glory of God. That's why he created you. That's why he sustained you. It's not just to have fun. It's to have the furtherance of the gospel through your life. How can you know you're saved? I want to uh, also subtitle this message some unimpeachable evidences. I'm not going to say a thing about Nancy. I ain't going to say a thing about Donald. I'm not going to say anything about politics. Some of you stayed home tonight because you thought I was. God help you. Amen. Just go ahead and watch CNN and uh, Fox, and you're going to miss the message from heaven. Amen. Just stay there. But, um, you know, we do live in a day full of doubt. Everybody doubts everybody. I mean, you know, we doubt politicians. We doubt each other. People doubt their husband. I was uh, counseling with a preacher yesterday about how to counsel with a young man in his church that um, his wife, as they have three little little children, I mean little, five, three, and 18 months old. And she just sends him a text and says, I'm finished. I, I don't want to be married anymore. Uh, I didn't have a childhood, didn't have a teenage life, so I just want to go out and, and uh, party and just left him. And, I, and he said, what do you say? And, you know, the only thing you can say is you better draw nigh to God, get a hold of God for her uh, to uh, get her heart right. So, uh, you know, we live in a day and age of real uncertainty. I mean, people, people just, they don't have that certainty. And in the old days, you know, when I was young, uh, there was some certainty. There was some safety. We never locked our doors. We never did. We never, we never locked our doors. Um, we were certain. Um, down in South Africa, there's a lot of uncertainty. I'll never forget the service I was in. And I was sitting in this chair, and I was certain that it was going to support me. And, um, and I collapsed right in the middle of the service. Brother Mark started laughing. It's the first time I've ever seen him laugh. No, he was laughing uh, at me. And uh, Brother Jeremy jumped off the platform, and he grabbed me and pulled me up and hurt me, pulling me up, you know. Amen? And the Sunday school teacher, in the meantime, kept on teaching. And I said, you know something? This ain't the first time this has happened. And I found out all fidgety people break down those plastic chairs. So. Guess what? I found a wooden bench on the side of the, <laughs> of the auditorium, and I sat right there on that wooden bench, amen. And, uh, but, you know, we're certain that it will hold our weight. We're certain we'll get to the destination. We get in our nice cars, and we're certain that it'll, it'll take us to that place. But I want to tell you something. Sometimes it don't. And I want to tell you something, though. There is some unimpeachable evidence uh, for the certainty of salvation. You ought to know that you know that you know that you're saved. Amen? And I went through all these born of God in seven times or five times mentioned in uh, this whole book, and that's evidence or birthmark. But I want us to go in context tonight, <clears throat> and I want to give you several th reasons uh, and evidences of how you can know you're saved. And when I go through this, if you don't know you're saved, don't let pride send you to hell. Uh, Brother Randy got saved in the parking lot out there because he didn't let pride send him to hell. Uh, he realized, as a preacher's son, he realized he was not saved, and he got saved uh, in a youth meeting, and Brother Tony led him lord in the car out there in the parking lot, I believe. Uh, Miss Stacy Carpenter, she's the preacher's uh, daughter, played our piano, and on a service that she got saved, she stopped playing the piano, come down to the altar, grabbed Miss Connie and said, I might be a preacher's daughter, but I'm lost, and I need to be saved. Now she's a preacher's wife, say amen right there, amen. It's wonderful. And so you need to know that you know that you're saved. So let's stand all the word of God. I'm going to read 10 verses and preach about 12, no, about 8. It says, whosoever, we're in 1 John 5, believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Now I want you to see that. We're going to call three witnesses that he is the Christ, that he is God in flesh. Um, when, he, when he died on the cross, he was God. 
And everyone that loveth him, that begot loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know, look at the word know, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God, there's that phrase mentioned several times in the sweet fellowship of 1 John. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Then he calls three witnesses. Number one, verse six. And this is he that came by water. The water is a witness. And blood, there is a witness. And even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, there is the third witness, that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there is three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Can somebody say amen right there? Amen. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath, not, hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for the good song service, and especially, God, the good prayer time, because, Lord, if we've ever needed to pray for each other, it's now, in these last days, these perilous times. God, thank you that we have more missionaries as uh, a candidate for prayer. We can support them by prayer. Thank you, Miss Rebecca, and the safe trip you gave her in Bo back to back to home, and I pray to God that you would uh, give them a good visit and good time together. Lord, I pray to your Lord that you would bless this message, and God, give us some confidence, give us some assurance. God, help us not to doubt you and doubt your word and doubt your witness, the Spirit. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's a lot of people that if you went up to them and asked them, if you died today, do you know you go to heaven? A lot of people would say, well, I hope so. That's not good enough. Folks, it's not good enough. Some people would say, well, I'm working on it. You know, I was thinking today, uh, Brother Kenny Kuykendall sent us pictures of the cross that Brother uh, Donald made for his beautiful, big auditorium. It's a lot bigger than that cross, but it's just like it. And he said he's been st uh, staining in his cell and so excited about Brother Donald making that cross. And he said he's got three or four messages just stained in that cross, you know. And I gave him a couple more just in case he needed it. I don't know why he would take one from me. But because um, I've been in Mark chapter 15. But I thought about what a church of Christ should hang on the back of their baptistry. You know what they ought to put on the back of their baptistry? A ladder. A ladder. Folks, you're not saved by works. You're not saved by religion. You're not saved by men's effort to be more like God. Folks, you're saved because Jesus, God's only son, came to this earth and took your place. So I want to give you four or five things and call several witnesses uh, and a lot of evidence on how you can know you're saved. Number one, there's a personal relationship. Look at verse one. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is, is the Christ is born of God and everyone that loveth him that begotteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now how many of you love Jesus? Say amen. How many you love God? Say amen. How many love the Holy Spirit? Say amen. amen. One time, Dr. John R. Rice, I thought about him at the funeral as uh, Brother Reed's uh, precious little blonde-headed girl, uh, grand granddaughter, got up and sang D John R. Rice's song, I'll See You Again. I'll See You Again. What a wonderful song. And uh, she got through it. It touched everybody's heart. But folks, I want to tell you something. If you're saved, you have a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. 
and you love him. Uh, John 16, 31 says, there's no other name under heaven, or excuse me, uh, says uh, what, the only way to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 14, uh, tw uh, 12 says there's no, there's no other name. Uh, look at John chapter 6, verse 47. John chapter 6, the other book uh, that uh, the apostle John wrote. John chapter 6 and verse 47. You got that up there, brother? I don't know if, I, if, he, if he sent it to you. He didn't send it to you? Okay, I sent it to Cody. I should have sent it to the sound room. I'm sorry, I didn't know you didn't get it. Uh, tell, him to, tell him to email it to you real quick. Amen? John chapter 6. So some of these folks can't function without this thing on the wall. Amen? I can. I'll can go on. It doesn't matter. We ain't going to shut her down. But uh, John chapter 6. I should have checked earlier. I'm sorry. I had too much on my mind. Uh, six, chapter, chapter 6, verse 47. The Bible says this, Then answered them, the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? See, folks, you can be deceived uh, and, um, and think you're saved when you're not saved. You need to know you're saved. Uh, John chapter um, 14, verse 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father. John chapter 3 says, You must be born again. Evidence of a physical birth are, are, are evidence, uh, and they're clear. Uh, when my children were born, I looked for evidence of life, crying, tears, moving their hands, you know, whatever. Uh, I wanted to see evidence of life. And I was about to pass out because it was the first time I'd been in there with twins, and she had, it, she had them naturally, and uh, Stephen got transverse and crossed and all kinds of stuff, and heart rate was going down. I was a nervous wreck. And, uh, but I made it through it, praise God. You know, we husbands, we make it through it, praise God. Now, when Jace was born, I was out by the coat machine, and they just notified me about 45 minutes after he was born. You know, I said, yeah, come on in now. You know, but anyway, it's different now. But, folks, there's evidence. And just as there's evidence of physical life, there's evidence of spiritual life. I want to tell you how you can know you're saved. Do you have some evidence? Are you have, do you have a, um, a desire? Uh, and I'll get, get to that in just a minute. Uh, let me just say this. Number two, there is a profound rearrangement. Wish I had that outline. That bothers me. Amen. Profound uh, rearrangement. Um, look at verse two. It says this. It says, "By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments." Look at this. And this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Can you just see that? Number two. Evidence of being saved is that personal faith uh, brings a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something, friend. You resemble the Father. You have a longing to keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. I want to tell you something. I have a lot of trouble believing a lot of people are saved that never come back to church after they get saved. Now, if they go to another church, praise God, you know. But I mean, they don't go anywhere. They just got their ticket to heaven, and they think they can live independent of God. They're real independent Baptists. They're not even in, a, in an independent Baptist church. But we ought to be dependent upon God. And I want to say this, friend. We need to realize that we need to be like the Father. You ever had somebody come up to you and say, Oh, he looks just like Mama. And they always say that because Daddy's always ugly. And they always say, Oh, I'm so glad they look like Mama. Amen. And, I'm, and, you know, he acts like his daddy, you know, and that's a, that's a real omen, and that's a real caution. But, you know, uh, that's the way it ought to be. A baby ought to resemble the father and mother. Say amen. And I want to say this. We as Christians have a profound rearrangement in our life. Look at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Look at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If you want to take that verse and, and, and kind of reverse it, if you believe in the Son of God, you're an overcomer. If you believe in the Son of God, you have the overcomer. Say amen. You're not perfect. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied. Peter cursed. But I want to tell you something. Noah wasn't a drunkard after he got saved. And Abraham was a liar, and Peter wasn't a curser. A cusser. I mean, a cursor is something on a, I do that every time on a computer. <laughs> God help us to realize if you're saved, 
You want to obey God. You want to be like God. And it's not a have to, it's a want to. Come on, say amen. And I know there's 100,000 people out here that's been hurt in a Baptist church in, in Whitfield County. But I want, to tell you, I want to tell you what I want to say to them. Get over it. Because my Lord was hurt too. And my Lord was rejected too. And my Lord was beat and my Lord was, was uh, forsaken and my Lord's own people turned against him. But that wasn't a reason to say, well, I ain't never going to go back to church. Folks, you want to go back to church because God gives you a new want to. Your deepest desire as a Christian ought to be this, to be like Jesus. And so his commandments are not grievous. Matter of fact, you know God so intimately, you know he wouldn't hurt you, he wants to help you. Can I repeat that? He doesn't want to hurt you, he wants to help you. I was counseling this week, I said, hey listen, I'm not in the, I'm not in the business to hurt anybody. I said, I want to help you. And if you get offended at me, you better take it up with God, because I'm going to tell you something, if I know my heart right, I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to help you. But I want to tell you something, sometimes the greatest help you can have is thou shall not. Say amen. Thou shall not commit adultery. That's the greatest commandment. Listen, that'll help you. Because if you do, if you do, there, it'll follow you the rest of your life. Even with forgiveness, Proverbs chapter 6. It could ruin your second or third marriage. It could really devastate your children when they find out about them. Say amen right there. And I'm just saying this, friend. God helped us not to think that the commandments are grievous. They're to make us more like Jesus. And they're to protect us. How many of you uh, mothers sometimes say, Thou shalt not to your children? And boy, they don't like it. Especially when they get about 16 and want your Mercedes Benz every night to drive. And you say, No. You failed 17 grades. You only took 16. Because you're not going to drive that car. And man, they pitch a fit. What? Johnny gets everything and he don't pass nothing. Well, Johnny's not, not my child. You are. I can hear the dialogue now that I used to have with my young ones. And I want to tell you something, friend. It's because I love them. You got to be at home at 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, because we love them. There's nothing good happens in downtown Dalton, especially during the beer fest, between... 11 and 4 o'clock in the morning. Say amen. And if any of y'all are participating in that, we're going to church it. I'm not kidding. You don't participate in junk of the world and think you can be a Whitfield Baptist Church member. Now that's real popular now, and I know the churches downtown don't, don't talk that way, but I want to tell you something. Folks, the commandments are not grievous. We're trying to help you. God's trying to help you. Heard someone say, that baby looks just like his father. Well, that's exactly the way we ought to look. And so there's a profound rearrangement. I want to give you some evidence of being saved, and you can know it. In verse 1, it says that you love him and also those that's begotten of him. And you know it, and I'll say it, and this theme of this chapter is not redundant or this book. Folks, if you're saved, you love who God loves. Can I say that one more time? You love who God loves. And the last time I checked, God loves you. And God loves every sinner. And God loves every saint. And so I want to tell you something. There ought to be one dominant trait in your life. Love. Look at 1 John 3.14, I believe it is. 1 John 3.14, yeah, it is. It says, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Death. You know, it's sad to say, but in the local independent Baptist church today, some people don't even love their wife like they should. They don't love their husband like they should. And they don't love their babies. They don't love their own babies. Walk off in the sunset and go, go play with the girls as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a lady that's never grown up. No, folks, if you've got the love of God and you love your children and you love each other and you love the church and you long to be with your family, I'm just saying, friend, this place ought to be special to you. This is your family. And one day you'll, you'll, 
I'm going to save that letter to, to Sunday morning, but one day you're going to need the church when somebody passes away. You're going to need the church when one of your kids go astray and you need somebody to pray with because you feel like it's the end of the world. You'll need the church. And I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about each other. And folks, so we will love the saints. That's the evidence. Look at verse 2. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And so John said it over and over and over again. He was called John the Beloved. Folks, if you're saved, the evidence of being saved is that you love God and that you love one another. And then number two, under the evidence of being saved, is that you live out the scriptures. You live out the scriptures. Look at verse 2, the last half of it. It says, and, and the, his commandments, and you keep his commandments. And then verse 3 says, and this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and the commandments are not grievous. It's not a have to, it's a want to. And then I'm going to say this, when you don't want to you, need to, you need to realize it's a have to. It's not the motive of your life. I'm going to tell you something. I'm faithful to my wife because I love her. And folks, if, and, and listen, if I ever thought about being unfaithful, I'm scared to be unfaithful. See, God could take my children. God could take my life. I fear him that much. I'm sorry I offended some of you about your little cell phones while I'm preaching, but I want to tell you something. You need to fear God. You need to fear God. And I want to tell you something, it's a fearful thing to, 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 to distract someone else when they're trying to worship God. I don't care how old you are. If you're old enough to sit up, you ought to listen. Amen? And you, ought to be, you ought to be thankful that you got the Word of God, and you ought to bring it, and you ought to look at it, you ought to memorize it, you ought to mark it, you ought to, you ought to study it. It ought to be your book. Because this book is God's Word to you. Isn't that precious? Isn't that precious? Somebody's emailed me a bunch of letters, and they weren't good letters. They were letters telling off the pastor and wanted me to judge them and tell, tell what my reaction would be. I'm glad he caught me on a good day. <laughs> Amen. But I want to tell you this, folks, we got love letters from heaven. We got guidelines from glory. And we've got the Holy Spirit telling us that, that this word is the will of God and it's the, it's, it's, it'll, it'll change your life. It'll fulfill your life. And if we don't read it, we insult the author. And if we don't obey it, we really insult the Father. And so we love the saints, number two, one, and then we live out the Scripture. We live out the Scripture. We demonstrate our salvation when we walk in humble obedience to the commandments of God. If you want to know what a converted heart is, it's a heart that loves and longs for the will of God. That's a converted heart. I didn't say that you cannot be carnal and backslide and be a prodigal son, but you won't stay in the pig pen forever because you will get lonely and you'll get hungry and you'll remember the Father's love and, he's, and he's, he's still looking for you, still longing for you. Obedience to the Word of God is proof positive of the spiritual birth. Turn back to 1 John 2. Uh, 1 John 2, 3 through 5. 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Haven't you enjoyed this study of 1 John? And I want to tell you something. There's a lot of people that need your teaching. They need you to take notes and go to people because they're going to say, Why, how do I know I'm saved? And you want to have the biblical answer. So I want you to circle born of God and born of Him uh, all through this great book. But look at uh, 1 John chapter 3. And I want you to look at um, uh, chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. 3 through 5. It says, Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now that's about as plain enough for me to understand. It says, For we, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Is that if you're saved, you keep his commandments. Look at verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a what class? Liar. And the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected, mature, fruit-bearing, 
Hereby know we that we are in him. That was a wonderful verse to read. And I want to tell you something. If somebody comes to me and says, well, I'm saved, and they never open their Bible, never crack it, never come to church, never think about God, never even resemble a Christian, you need to have serious doubts. You don't need to plant doubts in their heart, but you need to really treat them as if they're lost. You say, oh, I resent that. Well, just resemble God. You won't have to resent nothing. Amen? Praise God. So many people get touchy about, well, you calling me lost? No, I ain't calling you nothing. Because I'm not the judge. I'm just the fruit inspector. Amen? <laughs> and we're called to fruit inspect, not in judge. And by their fruits, you'll know them. Is this clear or not? Look, none, uh, listen, a heart that desires to obey the l word and the will of God is a converted heart. Let me repeat that. Y'all ought to write that down somewhere. A heart that desires to obey the word and the will of God is a converted heart. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. And the last time I checked, all he wants to do is crown him Lord. Amen? He wants to surrender. He wants to, you to submit. None will follow the word at perfect. You know that. Romans chapter 7, 18 through 25, Paul said, I want to do good, and I, do not, I don't do it. And he said, oh, wretched man am. He said, I, 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 17 times I. But in Romans 8, he says, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. I preach a message, get out of Romans 7 and get in Romans 8. Amen? Get out of I and self and get in the Spirit. And so, folks, you won't be perfect. Paul was not perfect. He said, oh, wretched man I am. But don't make any excuse. However, there's a desire to live for God. Why is there a desire to live for God? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Old, all things come new. And you know what's really new? Your appetite. Think about that a second. You have a new attitude. You might have a new attire. You might have a new uh, um, actions. But I want to tell you something. Preceding all that, you have a new appetite. You really want to be like Christ. You really want to grow. You really want to glorify God. I mean, because he that is greater than the devil is in you saying, hey, I want you to yield to me and I'll do the living through you. He's the liver. Amen. He's the lover, but he's the liver. And I'm not talking about physical liver. I mean, he'll live through your life. And it's not a wheeling and dealing in the Christian life. It's yielding. So if when you're yielded to the Spirit of God, you're like Jesus. You don't become less human. You don't roll around the floor speaking in some language that nobody can understand. That can get a little immodest if you're a lady rolling around the floor, jumping pews, hanging from chandeliers. God didn't call us to do that. Some people say, oh, no, that's spiritual. You're judging people. Show me in the Bible where we should do it. We'll do it. Folks, we're to be like Jesus. Jesus was a gentleman. Jesus was appropriate. Amen? He was timely. He didn't intrude in people's life. He invited people to let him be his life. Let me hurry and I'll close with this. Number three, we know through a clear witness. This is what I want to get to. Six through ten is some tremendous verses. If you're not careful, you'll misunderstand them all. Uh, First Corinthians, I mean, First John chapter um, five. Look at verse. Um, let me look, look at verse four and five. I'll skip that. Uh, you'll not only live out the scriptures, but you'll leave, you'll leave sin. You'll leave sin. Look at verse 4. It says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? I preached on that last week, but I want to tell you something. We're in a warfare, and the world is the world system. It's the antichrist spirit that's predominant in the world today. We live in a post-Christian America. If you don't believe it, listen to some of the stuff that's spewed around about killing babies, about taking the rights of churches away from them, and all the things that they're, they're promoting. Wickedness, ungodliness. I never thought we'd live in a day where you couldn't watch a TV program for uh, uh, firemen kissing each other. It's, 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 it's sad. It's pitiful. There's an agenda. And these Hollywood actors think they can run America. They got another thought coming. They can't even run their own home. Most of them have been married seven times. No offense if you've been there and done that, but I'm just saying 
they do not have the voice of God. I remember a little, uh, uh, that guy that used to be Opie, or whatever his name, red-headed guy, the big, the big uh, Rod, Rod, yeah, I need Rod somebody, I don't know. Ron Howard, yeah. I'm not that holy, I'm just forgetting his name. Ron, Ron Howard, yeah. He made this statement, making a movie in Georgia. And he says, if you do the heartbeat bill, I and my whole staff and all of my company is going to move back to California. You know what I really wanted to do? I wanted to find him and rent a U-Haul it truck from Harris Service Center and say, I'll help you. Amen. I really did. I wanted to say, hey, Get out of Georgia, you heathen. But I'm so kind and nice, I'd never say that publicly. But folks, who do they think they are? If we don't want to kill babies, that's it between us and God. But oh, I'm going to withdraw Hollywood from Atlanta because you're not supporting the LBGTQ whatever it is, you know. And that's pathetic. Even Billy Graham's son came out today with a great article about Let's don't be godless in the next election. Let's don't have the agenda that LGBT. I said, praise God. I didn't know he was that conservative. Amen. I said amen and posted it. I know all my independent friends are going to just forsake me for posting something from Billy Graham. Because, you know, we're so independent, fundamental, we don't get along with nobody. But um, it's sad. It's sad. It's sad. But the world's got their agenda. And so you know what our agenda ought to be? Godliness. Holiness. Life. Love. Joy. Peace. Marriages that last. Children that turn out right. That's our agenda. Amen? And you know, some, some of these heathens come to me and try to, try to back me in a corner. I say, well, hey, how's, let me just ask you a question. How are you doing? How's your family? How's your marriage? I'd like to ask every one of those Hollywood stars, How's your marriage? How's your children? I know some good parents that their children rebel, but I want to tell you something. The mass, vast majority of those guys can't even keep their home home together. And they're trying to tell Georgia how to not vote. And now that's in legislation, now there's lawyers, and they're trying to cut it down because we won't. Uh, and I want to tell you something. I don't think that's strict enough. I don't think it's first heartbeat. I think it's conception. That's not political, that's biblical. It's conception. Jeremiah was called to preach in the womb. Jesus did not cease being a human being in the womb. Life begins at conception. Psalms 139 says he knows our substance. That's, that word means our, he knew us when we were in the embryonic state. And we were still, and he knew our names, and he knew our character, and he knew that I would lose my hair at 30 and he knew I'd lose my eyesight at 60 and he knew, he knew I'd fall apart at 70 or something. You know, he knew that. Isn't it great to look forward to that, praise God. He knew I'd have brown eyes. He knew of my temperament. He knew everything about me in the womb. That's what Psalms 139 says. And folks, I want to tell you something. You're in trouble if you're back in that crowd. Because I want to tell you something, that's the crowd of darkness, that's the crowd of sin, and I want to tell you something, you're going to answer the judgment seat of Christ for who you li link up with. Boy, I'll tell you what, we ought to leave that sinful crowd. We ought, to have, we ought to take a stand. We ought not just leave it. We ought to stand against it, and we ought to speak out again. Oh, no, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That's what's wrong with America today. That's why prayer's out of the school. That's why the heathens are taking over, because we didn't want to hurt anybody. And guess, guess what? Children are getting slain in the hallways and kids are, kids are getting uh, mutilated and pulled out of the womb because we didn't want to hurt anybody. We need to stand for God. We need to turn from the sinful crowd. The best way you can know that you're saved is by the fact of the difference after you got saved. Now, I was 11 years old. I wasn't a drunk. And I didn't even talk back to Mama. But I want to tell you something. I need to be saved just as much as my alcoholic brother. Just as much. And there wasn't a great change. I was already a good kid because I was scared of my mama. She beat the devil out of me. Amen. And I needed it. Thank God for her. I'll thank her when I get to heaven. I wasn't such an immoral kid, but I would have been an immoral kid and an immoral adult. 
Folks, I want to tell you something. The evidence of you being saved is you leave the sinful life. It's called repentance. You don't hear that preach much, do you? Repentance. That means you have a change of mind towards God. He's God. He's the Son of God. And you have a change of mind towards sin. You say, I don't want to live that way anymore. And these people that think they get saved and can live the same way, they're kidding themselves. And these people that get saved and have no desire for holy things, you better check that out. Amen. I know I'm preaching to the Wednesday night crowd, but you know a whole lot of people in your family and on your job that say they're saved and there's no fruit. You need to be concerned about their eternal soul. Yes, they prayed a prayer when they was two years old. Yes, they, you know, I, I talked to a lady one time and she said, I know I'm saved. You can't talk me out of it. I said, well, just tell me when you were saved. She said, I was baptized and, or christened when I was two months old. I said, so you're Catholic. She said, yes, I am. I'm saved because of that. I said, you basing it on that? She said, yes, I am. I was christened into the family of God. And then I took the, at 12, I was confirmed when I took the Lord's the communion, and it turned, that wafer turned into the body of Jesus, and I took Jesus into my life. And I said, there's only one way. And it's Jesus. He's Jesus. And I said, ma'am, can I ask you a question? When you got saved, whatever day it was, was there a change? She said, no, there wasn't a change. I was two months old. And I said, well, the only way I can tell that you're saved is there's a change. So I'm going to ask you again, the best way you can know that you're saved is by the fact that you are different than you were before you were saved. Amen. A lot of people come in my office, study, and they say, I'm closing. They say, well, I don't know if I'm saved. You know what I really want to say? If you don't, I don't. I'm not, an, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one that can look into your soul. Only God can do that. But I'll say, listen, I can help you. Let me ask you a question. When do you think you were saved? They'll go back, you know, 1957, I walked the aisle and, and I got baptized and, you know, I had crocodile tears and they didn't show me in the Bible anything, but, you know, I, tr I tried my best and I, I believed in the Lord Jesus. And I said, well, that's great. And you could have been saved then. But let me ask you a question. From that day forward, was your life different? Because I'm going to say something. If Jesus is in your heart, you're different. There's a change. There's a miracle. And I won't tell you what that miracle is, and I'll go over this next week, 6 through 10. It's the miracle of the witness of the Spirit. The Spirit of God lives in your heart. Romans 8, 9. Let me just read that, and I'll close. I can't get to the point. Romans 8, 9. Maybe we'll find the outline by then. I probably sent it to Sears Roebuck. I don't know where I sent it. But uh, look, at, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 9, please. Uh, and this is a great verse, Romans 8 and 9. It says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And so it says, and so, and so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if the man, it says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So what is that saying? You're either saved or lost. And the way you determine that is, when you got saved, somebody moved in. The Holy Spirit moved in. God the Father moved in. God the Son moved in. And you can't tell me that if those three, the Holy Trinity lives in your heart, that you can go on and live for the devil and the flesh and the world. There is repentance. You change your heart towards sin. You change your heart towards God. But you don't do the changing. God the Holy Spirit does it. He gives you a new desire, a new want to. He abides in your heart. And praise God, you don't wait on the feeling. The result is that you yield to the Spirit of God and He gives you the feeling. So it's the fact of the gospel. And it's faith in the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. And so folks, either you're saved or you're not. And all these people you talk to, they're either in or, or they ain't. And I want to tell you something. A lot of people are going to go to hell thinking they're saved. Wide is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to hell. And I'm going to tell you what's so sad. And I say this, and I said this to a lady that was very confused Saturday morning. I was 
Brother Jason and I were talking to her on the porch. She was so confused. She said, I, I don't think I'm saved, but I, you know, I did this. I, I might be saved. And I, said, so I said, well, listen, if you'll come to church faithfully every time the doors open and you'll be faithful and let the word of God speak to your heart, you'll find out where you're at. The Holy Spirit will put the light on your soul. The Holy Spirit will illuminate your mind, not eliminate it. And he'll show you if you're saved or not. Because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that hearing means heeding. And so what you do is you just be open and honest before God in a church service. But I want to tell you something. A lot of people that think they're saved never come to church. And I'm going to tell you the danger, danger of that is that they might be lost and they don't know it. And if they just get in church, we won't pull them down the aisle, but the Holy Ghost will convict them. Because they'll realize, I don't have the witness. Verse 7, 8 and 9 of 1 John 5. I don't have the witness. He's not saying in my heart, you belong to Jesus. There's no conviction. You're about to... You're about to smoke a joint or you're about to uh, uh, kill somebody and the Holy Spirit says, doesn't say, says anything. I want to tell you something. If you're saved, the Spirit of God's going to say, no! Sin! That won't glorify God! And the more you ignore the Word of God, the lower that volume is and you just hear a barely a whisper. And you can do some awful things out of the Word of God, even saved. And I want to tell you something, you stay in the Word of God, stay in Sunday school, stay in church, stay in Bible study, stay in the Word of God, there's a volume turned up, and that still small voice whispers to you, that's not the will of God, that won't glorify God, that's not the ultimate good for your, for your life, don't do it. And it sways you and moves you and checks you, you ever been checked by the Holy Spirit? directs you and woos you and loves you to love the Father and to love His commandments and they're not grievous. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these evidences. Thank You for these testimonies that are undeniable. That we love the saints. That we live out the Scripture. And that we leave the sinful. Just leave the sinful. God, thank you for your word that's so clear, so plain. God, so convicting. Lord, I feel sorry for those that's never on the sound of good, godly, spirit-filled preaching and teaching. God, help us. God, help us to realize that there's a lot of evidences. There's a profound rearrangement in our life. There's a personal relationship. And we know through a clear witness, the witness of the Spirit, that we're safe. We're safe. And we're safe in your arms. And that we don't belong to this stinking sinful world. And we surely don't belong to Satan anymore. We don't even belong to ourselves. We belong to you. And Lord, those sure are good hands to be in. So Lord, please bless this message we might help others that are so uncertain. God, help us to give them these unimpeachable evidences, these undeniable witnesses in their life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, how many say, Preacher, if I died today, I know I'd go to heaven. Would you raise your hand as a happy testimony of that? Can the Holy Spirit let you lift your hand? How many glad you know, say amen. amen. Not think so, hope, if, and, or but, but you know. Praise God. That will make you excited and thrilled and peaceful and joyful. Several cannot raise your hand, but you're saved. And you say, preacher, I'm not sure, but I sure want to be. And I want you to please pray for me. I won't pull you down the aisle. I won't try to make you make a decision right now. You could. You should. But I want to pray for you. I'm not sure, but I want you to pray for me.
you slip your hand up real high for prayer that you're not sure, absolutely 100% sure that you're saved. And if you've ever been 100% sure of anything, it ought to be this. Anyone? Even on a Wednesday night? How many say, preacher? I know a whole bunch of people. And I know a whole bunch of people that say they're saved, but they have no appetite for the things of God. And I know there's been hurts in the past, and I know there's been things going on, and, but I just really want them to be sure, because I love them. And I don't want to see them go to hell. And I don't want to see them live beneath their privilege of not having a family like we have, and love like we have, and help like we have, and fellowship like we have. It's wonderful. I love this church with all my heart. I can't, I can't imagine me being anywhere else for these 42 years. It's been the joy of my life to be your pastor. I mean that. But just to be your brother or sister, your, to be a brother and sister in Christ would be a privilege. But you'd say, preacher, somebody I know is missing it. I want you to please pray with me for them that I could influence their life into making sure and then being settled for God. Would you raise your hand on their behalf before we close? All over this place. I got to raise my hand. I got so many relatives that never darkened the doors of the church and they say they're saved. And every Thanksgiving I preach around the turkey meal and they hate it. But I love them and I'll keep on doing it. Father, thank you for this wonderful time we've had together. In this wonderful chapter, I hope I've done it justice as far as rightly to dividing it and preaching it with compassion and love, but also with truthfulness. God help us. God help us, Lord, to hear the witness and be the witness that you can know for sure. I pray for every hand that was uplifted, for loved ones, workmates, neighbors, family have no evidence, no fruit, no joy, no peace. God, help us to reach them. In Jesus' precious name, we beg you.